An example there of why anytime someone asks me how I am, it's just easy to say I have been blessed beyond measure by those two girls. So I thank God for them. This morning we're going to be in 2 John. We're going to be 2 John chapter, or excuse me, 2 John verses 1 through 6. And we're going to look at love for God, part 1. 2 John verses 1 through 6. About two years ago, a family that did not have a church home reached out to me and asked if I would come and speak at a family member's funeral. It was held at a funeral home. The family handled all of the arrangements. They just wanted me to come and share a few words. As, uh, as, the, as I was prepared to walk up, the family wanted to play one more song, and they played a song by Bette Midler. And uh, the song went on and on about what some say love is. And so I sat there and I listened to that song, and then I came forward. And I believed in that moment that, that God had sovereignly placed me at that funeral home uh, in order that I could open up His Word and proceed to share with that family that God is love. And that love was not merely an inner feeling or even words, but that love is action. And that the God who is love demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I was able to communicate to them the reason that God did this. The Bible says, and we said just a moment ago, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Apostle John, the author of this brief letter, was there at the cross on the very day, at the very moment, when God's great love was on display. He knew Jesus loved the world, not merely because Jesus said it, because Jesus showed it. Let's look at 2 John verses 1 through 6. The Bible says to the elect lady, or excuse me, the elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your peace. Father, I pray that uh, as we open up your word at this time, Father, I pray that, uh, that you would, uh, would use me, Lord. Speak to your church. Father, I pray that, uh, that I would decrease in this moment. Father, and that as we look to your inspired word, Father, as we look to your word which is true and sufficient, I pray, Lord, that your church would see Jesus. Father, I pray that your church would see how you have called us all to live. Father, I pray that you would just move me out of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. John, as was often the case for the apostles, was providing instruction to a church that was battling against false teaching. This church was being ravaged by individuals who did not love Jesus, who did not love his church. And he begins, as many letters did at that time, with an introduction. If you look to your Bible, verses 1 and 2, we read, The elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, 
but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. We see there in the introduction, it begins with the sender, the one who is writing the letter. The Bible merely says, the elder. The church recognized him as John. Throughout church history, he's been recognized as John. He was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Due to his stature in the church, his ministry there in the area in and around Ephesus, they knew exactly who it was. They did not need to distinguish him by saying the elder John or John the elder. They knew who was writing by simply saying the elder. Next, we turn our attention to the recipients, identified as to the elect lady and her children. This is to be properly understood as to a church and its members, to a local body of believers there and the members that made up that body. The term, the elect lady and her children, is believed to be used because the Romans would often intercept letters and to keep there from being increased persecution in the church should that letter be intercepted it simply looks as though it's being written to a lady and her children but we know it to be to the church john writes to them a congregation that he had a relationship with he writes whom i love in truth and not only i but also all those who have known the truth. John makes an appeal to the heart. The false teachers that did not love this church, they were seeking to ravage this church. They were trying to destroy this church. The Holy Spirit directed many of the letters we find in the New Testament as instruction against false teaching to strengthen the church as they receive it. John wants the church to know in this brief letter, what I'm going to share with you isn't easy. But I'm going to tell you the truth because I love you. And John's love for them is grounded in truth. And it's not only John's, but if you look to your Bible, but also all those who have known the truth. A local church unites around the truth. A group of churches, Christians from a whole other set of churches, can unite around the truth. The truth of Jesus Christ. Who He is. What He has done. And how we are to live in light of what He has done for us. A local church unites, and the Bible says, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Now this was an important affirmation for John to make to this church because they had watched many walk away from this church. They had watched many give in to false teaching. If we follow the the line of 1 John into 2 John, we see that many merely walked away. The Bible tells us that it gave evidence that they did not know the truth. Their walking away was evidence that they did not have a relationship with Jesus, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. So John has a commitment to them. There is a shared truth in place between John and this congregation. John moves in to what would be considered the formal greeting of the letter. And he communicates to them a promise. Look to your Bible in verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Now, a typical first century letter would include a hope for these things. Even a prayer that these things would take place. If you look to the letters of Paul where it says grace to you and peace. It's it's a plea, it's a petition, it's it's a prayer. John expresses this truth as a promise. 
He knows that the truth of Jesus Christ abides in them. It was abiding in them in that present moment, and it would abide in them forever. And so John points the church to grace, which is unmerited favor from God. It means we did not get, we get what we do not deserve. That is grace. And when you pause and we think about God's grace, when we think about getting what we do not deserve, there is simply no better description than to say God's grace is amazing. And from that grace, and note closely, it is from that grace we are pointed to mercy, which is not merely God's willingness to forgive sin, but it's God's readiness to give sin, forgive sin. It is God's desire to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. So we see from the headwaters of grace and mercy flow peace. We can't have peace with God without God's grace, without His mercy. That peace with God is being reconciled to Him. It's no longer being in a position of hostility against God. It is someone who has received salvation. If you look to your Bible, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you. This was not hope. This was not a promise. This is, this is a promise from John that Jesus' death and resurrection from the dead made. That grace, mercy, and peace would be certainties for all those who believe. And look to your Bible. Grace, mercy, and peace find their source from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. Notice the double emphasis on from. Grace, mercy, and peace come from God the Father. Grace, mercy, and peace come from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. The Father and the Son on equal footing. Remember the persecution that Jesus faced when he would tell the, the crowd that God was his Father. And the Bible tells us in John 5, 18 that when he did that, he was making himself equal with God. And the people hated it. The Father and Son on equal footing, separate in responsibility. The very name Jesus means Jehovah saves. It's a reminder every time we say that word that salvation comes from God. John was there. He was battling against false teachers. They rejected the reality. They rejected the truth that Jesus was God. They denied the very reality that Jesus the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is the, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If you look back to your Bible, verse 3, we see this, this promise is made in truth and love. The very foundation for the first century congregation reading this letter, the very foundation for the 21st century congregation that is assembled here at 2502 Asheville Highway as we read this letter. The foundation of this is faithfulness to the truth and an obedience to God's command to love. Folks, we live in a culture today that is doing everything possible to try to separate truth and love. Jesus' church has got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. The Bible tells us, speak the truth in love. We do not have to separate the two. The very foundation of this letter 
is grounded in truth and love. John has given the introduction. He's let them know who he's, who's writing. He's instructed who he's writing to. And he's offered them the promise that they have grace, mercy, and peace. And it comes from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now John moves in to the instructions. We're going to look at one today. And that is love for God is demonstrated by obedience to God's commands. Look to your Bible, verse number 4. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. Think about John there as, as one who very likely was the founding apostle for this congregation. He was the one that had brought the word to them. He was the one that had shepherded them. Even with this very letter, he is shepherding the church there. And he rejoices as he gets word that there are folks there that are living in faithfulness to the truth. Folks that are living as the Bible says to live. Folks that have taken the instruction from the Father. Remember, Jesus said in John 7, 16, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. John was rejoicing over their faithfulness. I remember as we made our way down to Costa Rica in January, and our first night in Costa Rica, we are sitting at the table there in this breezeway at the, at the compound where we stayed, and our host missionary, Mario, was talking with us. We were getting to know one another. There were bats that were flying back and forth through this breezeway as we were eating our food. And very early on, Mario looked right at me, and, and in the best English that, that he could explain to me, he, he asked me, he said, are you an expository preacher? And I was stunned in that moment. I have never had that question on the mission field. And so I stopped, and I wanted to make sure we had the same understanding. And I said, do you mean that I go verse by verse, and we work our way through a passage? And he said, yes. And I said, well, then, yes, I'm an expository preacher. And he put his hands together, and he praised God. We went on to start talking about just the, the damage that the false prosperity gospel was doing there in Costa Rica. And Mario rejoiced as we sat at that table that God had sent five men from Balfour Baptist Church that were committed to the Word of God. I rejoiced as I talked with Mario to know that God had sent us to a man and a ministry there in Costa Rica that is committed to the Word of God. Now, all of us can probably think about a family member or someone that we have invested our life in that is no longer walking in the truth. It's heartbreaking as you think back and you see someone that maybe for a period of time was alive for Christ, and now they are just relishing sin. We should also rejoice when we see someone walking in truth. That should be a reminder for the church. While as heartbreaking as it is to watch someone not walk in the truth, we should rejoice as we see folks walking in the truth. When we see the children in this church taking their Sunday school lesson, and, and moving from it being something they've learned to seeing it implanted in their heart and watching it come out in their hands, watching it come out in their actions and their words. We should rejoice in those moments. When we see some of our students that are faced with challenging moral decisions and they choose to go God's way, we should rejoice in those moments. 
when we see our single adults reject the hookup culture that is this world, and they commit to walk with God in accordance to His ways, we should rejoice. When an exhausted mother wakes up a little bit earlier one day, even when she doesn't want to, because she wants to spend time in the Word. She wants to spend time with her Savior before the day begins. We should rejoice. When we see a dad call his family together and say, we're going to read the Bible. We're going to pray. We as a church should rejoice. And when we see our senior adults that have run the race that is the Christian faith, and we see their very commitment to run that race to the very end, not stopping short, we as a church should rejoice. That's what John did. That's what we should do as we see one another walking in the truth. Look to your Bible, verse number 5. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. John is not adding to their to-do list. He's not drawing back and saying, I've got one more thing I need to tell you. He's reminding them from the command they had from the very beginning, Love one another. Remember in Matthew, Jesus was asked by the scribe, by the, by the lawyer that, that came up, and he asked Jesus in Matthew twenty two thirty six. 36, he said, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? You remember Jesus' response? He had 613 commandments he could have drawn from. He could have started listing them. Jesus looked at that man and he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Love God, love others. That is the commandment. If you look further in verse 5 and you see that the appeal is made to the church, love one another. Verse 6, we see a definition for what love looks like. This is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. To walk is to live. They understood as they read this, when you are walking in something, you are living that truth out in your life. You are living as God has instructed you to live. One commentator wrote, we can do nothing more or better for our Christian brothers and sisters than to live obedient to God. If we live according to God's commandments, we will love one another. It is as simple as that. As I desire to be a more selfless husband, how am I to do that? I am to live in obedience to God's commands. He told us in Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. As I desire to be a more intentional father, how am I to do that? I am to live in obedience to God's commands. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 2, And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord's. God's commandments find their very foundation in love. Look back to verse number 6. We see at the very end, And you should walk in it. Those three words at the very end have confused translators for a long time. Because those three words in the original 
language are intentionally vague. They don't point specifically to love, and they don't point specifically to truth. Some of your Bibles, it may say, walk in love. The translations that say, walk in it, I believe are more faithful to what the text says because the Holy Spirit is instructing us to walk in truth, which we see in verse 4. Walk in love, which we see in verse 6. We are instructed to walk in truth and love. I read a story this week about a family in the Northeast. It was a mom and a dad. And they had three daughters. And they volunteered for an organization that's called Safe Families. This organization's expressed goal is to provide a Christ-centered home in the hopes that they can keep children out of the foster program there in the Northeast. Sometimes it's a, it's a short overnight stay. Sometimes it may be longer. There was a mother that was a, a recent uh, immigrant to our country, and she had COVID-19, and she was seriously ill. She was in need of hospitalization. Her two daughters also had COVID-19. Their illness was not to the level of hospitalization, but they were also in need. This mother and her two daughters, they had no family here. They had no friends that they could count on. They reached out to safe families to try to see as this mother was hospitalized with a severe case of COVID-19. These two daughters feeling the effects, having that very same virus. Safe families reached out to the mom, the dad, and the three daughters. And they said, can you give these two girls a place to stay? Now, that family had every reason to say no in that moment. Here they were bringing COVID-19 into their home. They had every reason to say no in that moment. But instead, they said yes. The oldest daughter cleaned out her room. She went to stay in her sister's room. They dedicated an entire section of that home to these two girls that had COVID-19. They gave them food. They gave them medicine. They hooked up a tablet for Wi-Fi so that they could communicate back and forth with their mother who was in the hospital. Each one eventually recovered. Each one got to see the love of Jesus on display by the actions of that family. Jesus gave instructions to his disciples on the night of his arrest. He said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. COVID-19 has brought with it a brand new vocabulary. We have heard phrases such as stay at home, quarantine, shelter in place, and social distance. Many have taken those instructions and they have turned their focus inward. Netflix and Hulu and streaming services right now are seeing users and viewership through the roof as people have stayed home, focused inward. As Christians, our focus must be outward. As Christians, our eyes must be open, looking for an opportunity to love someone like Jesus loves them. As Christians, our ears must be open, listening for opportunities to serve someone like Jesus does. Each one of us should pray daily, and, I, and I've loved talking with Jim Darnell about this. We should pray daily as he does. Lord, put someone in, my, in, in, in front of me, put someone in my path that I can help today. 
Jesus didn't tell his disciples, by all this you will know that you are my disciples if you wear a cross around your neck. Jesus didn't say, by all this will know that you are my disciples by how often you share Bible verses on Facebook. Jesus told his disciples, by all this you will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus instructs his church to walk in truth and love. Jesus instructs his church that a love for God is demonstrated by obedience to God's commands. Take a look around this sanctuary for a moment. Just look around at at one another. Maybe even look backwards if if you you need to. Look, Look around... And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not doing, well, I, they did. You guys have actually kind of spread out a little bit. Usually everybody sits right there. We've, we've spread out a little bit. Look, as you look around this sanctuary, I want you to know, if you are here this morning, and you are a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you consider this place home, the people you just looked at are your family. That's that's the truth. The people you looked at are your family. And we are commanded to love one another. When a member of the Balfour family is down, whether that is through illness or surgery, whether that is through death or job loss, whatever it might be, When a member of the family is down, the Balfour family must step up. The Balfour family must be the first to pray. There should be prayers coming from the Balfour family. The Balfour family should be making phone calls. The Balfour family should be sending cards. But let me say something, church. Calls and cards, those must be our starting point, not our ending point. Because when someone in the Balfour family is down, the Balfour family should be bringing meals. The needs that that family might have should be met by the Balfour family. You see, when the church acts as the church is to act, we give witness to the lost family members, the lost neighbors, and the lost co-workers. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Think about the witness it gives to lost neighbors, lost family members, lost co-workers when the church doesn't love one another. When co-workers that don't even know God Don't even walk with Jesus. Minister better than Jesus' church does. That gives a terrible witness. Think about the encouragement it brings to a member of the Balfour family when we love one another. That is a tangible reminder in that moment as that person is down that the people that I love, they love me. And their love for me is more than just words. Their love for me is actions. What is one way, as we leave out of here today, what is one way that you and I can love one another this week? Maybe it's taking someone to lunch. Maybe it is finding out and meeting a need that's right here in the family. You know, I I opened by explaining that uh, Bette Midler offered several options for what some say that love is. Jesus' church right here at 2502 Asheville Highway must not settle by simply telling others and saying what love is. Jesus' church right here should show what love is. 
by loving one another. Church, what would it look like if we committed to memory John 13, 35? By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What if we committed that to memory? And the next time someone in the Balfour family had an illness, the next time someone in the Balfour family had a surgery, the next time we became aware of a need right here in the Balfour family, we put the very truth of that scripture into practice as we love one another. Let's pray this morning. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that as uh, we are commanded in the Scripture to love one another, Father, that we don't have to guess and pretend to, to know what love is and what it looks like. Father, we thank you that you are a God who loves us, loves us in such a way that you demonstrated what love is as Jesus went to the cross for our sins and died in our place, buried, rising again the third day, just as you said would happen. Father, we don't have to look around our culture, around this world, to understand how to love. You show us how to love. Father, I pray that as a church, we would love one another. Father, I pray that as as a church, we would love one another by our words and by our actions. Father, I pray this morning, if there's one here that does not know what love is, Lord, that today would be the day they would look to you and they would realize you have shown them that. They would confess their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.